Hey folks, this is Linda Shenton Matchett, and I am back with Moments in History here on Facebook Live. I've been missing for the last couple of weeks. Things have been very, very hectic here at the house, uh, as well as personally and at work. So uh, it's been a couple of weeks since I've been with you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am an author of Christian historical fiction, primarily set in the World War II era. And I'm sharing a lot of my research and artifacts that I have collected over the years that I've been writing. So today I'm going to be talking about women in uniform. And uh, I don't have any uniforms per se, so what I'll be doing is um, I've got some posters of the different uh, organizations that the women served in, and that should give you a flavor for what, what they have. Um, and I wanted to let you know that I do have some more artifacts that I'll be sharing next week. Uh, just got them in the mail, been doing a little uh, treasure shopping on eBay, and they all arrived today. So I'm very excited about that, and we'll be sharing that uh, with you next week. So, uh, the first ladies that I am going to be talking about, let's get the right poster, um, is the Women's Army Corps. And um, this is the women's uniform, as you can see. And the, uh, the blue star there is part of the um, program where homes who had folks serving in the armed forces could have a blue star for each individual that's in their family that's in the service uh, and then unfortunately it was converted to a gold star if that person was lost during the uh, during the conflict so um, that is the the uh, women's auxiliary corps uh, later it was known as the women's army corps and that was um, the first organization that was started in the armed forces auxiliary organization and that was may of 1942 so it was only six months after pearl harbor uh, when the army realized that it did need some help and it did need uh, the women's help and so they got aveta culp hobby uh, she was a very prominent texan socialite who jumped in with both feet and did quite a number on getting the organization up and running and she later became the first director of the department of health and human services and uh, what they did was they modeled the wax um, after the british units uh, like the ATS and some of the others. And initially, they were trained only in three areas. Uh, they, ha they were switchboard operators, mechanics, which I thought was an interesting combination, and bakers. So the women's uh, army had them answering telephones, baking bread, and working on cars, which, I, again, I thought was an interesting combination. Um, eventually, over the course of the war, the specialties would go into the dozens they were they pretty much did just about everything other than go to combat they were the largest women's auxiliary uh, uniformed service and they had well over 150,000 women serve uh, in that branch so uh, the next organization that we have um, is are the waves um, and that is uh, the women's women accepted for voluntary emergency services and I don't know if you can see uh, there's a sailor next to that young lady and so that is the Navy's version of their auxiliary organization and the woman that they got to head up their organization was a that was the president of Wellesley College so all of these organizations, interestingly enough, were headed up by women who were very highly educated and had gone to some of the top women's colleges in the country. thought that was very interesting. Uh, the WAVES served in uh, 900 different naval stations. Um, the only overseas territory, excuse me, uh, post that they served on was in Hawaii, which at that point was still a territory. So uh, that was the only overseas or, uh, place that the women served. And they basically took over anything that the male officers did to take their place to release them to go into combat, um, including physicians and engineers and many of the very technical uh, things. But they also did clerical and administrative work, which was not unusual because that's a lot of what women did in the workforce. 
Uh, there were also parachute riggers. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, the Women's Air Corps did that, uh, the Coast Guard, which I'm going to talk to. So I believe that every branch that was out there had a cadre of women who were parachute riggers. And uh, just under 90,000 women served in the, uh, in the Navy's auxiliary group, which again is called the Waves. Uh, so the Coast Guard, not to be outdone, uh, that's, that's a woman in their particular uniform. They were called the spars, and that was taken from the Latin for uh, semper paratus, which is always ready or always prepared. And so that was their clever acronym that they used for their ladies. That was created, uh, this organization was created by Congress in November of 1942. Um, and they actually were part of a joint recruiting effort between the Marines and the Navy. Uh, so that was done together. Unfortunately, the partnership did not work out. I don't know if they didn't share well or didn't play well in the sandbox. Um, there really was not a lot of information that I found with regard to why they backed out. But they did separate and the Coast Guard began to do the, its own recruiting um, and that was in July of 1943. Uh, so again, they were headed up by a woman who was very highly educated. She had been the Dean of Women at Purdue University. Um, and she was already in the waves. She was a Lieutenant in the waves. And so she was uh, promoted to Lieutenant Commander and then shifted over to the Coast Guard. Uh, and then later on was uh, promoted again to a captain. Um, so the spars, these ladies were in absolutely every Coast Guard district um, except Puerto Rico, and they served as general duty officers. Uh, again, lots of parachute riggers, a lot of clerks, a lot of general duty officers, lots of drivers. Uh, and then there were some uh, select few who worked with LORAN, uh, which is a very top secret at the time, radio navigation system. Uh, they worked at the monitoring stations, uh, so that gave them something um, very hush-hush to work on. And um, it was a much smaller group than either the WAVES or the WAX. There were only about 11,000 women that served in the Coast Guard, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, and then we have our Marines. Um, and the, the thought behind the Marines recruiting was that for each woman that was recruited, that would release a, a male Marine, uh, to fight and to go into combat. Uh, the Marine Women's Reserve was the only organization auxiliary that did not have a snappy nickname. Uh, there were some, uh, derisive nicknames that were come up by the press and by male uh, Marines, but there was nothing official. In fact, uh, the general who was in charge of uh, the Marines overall, as well as the women's auxiliary, said they train with the Marines, they um, are a Marine, and there's no reason to call them anything but a Marine. So it was strictly known as the Women's Reserve, the Marines Women's Reserve. Um, so their leader, uh, Ruth Cheney Streeter, uh, was chosen as their leader and sworn in as a major. She was a graduate of Bryn Mawr College, which is in Pennsylvania. And again, a very well-known, very highly respected um, college. Uh, they had, the Marines had over 200 specialties listed as far as what people would be allowed to do, or these women, excuse me, would be allowed to do. Um, but frankly, about 50% of the women served in clerical roles. So, um, and then, again, they did not serve overseas, but eventually did serve in, uh, in the territory of Hawaii. They were a little bit larger than the Coast Guard, and they had about 19,000 members. Now, if any of you folks are familiar with these women's auxiliaries, um, type yes in the comments or the name of the organization that you are aware of. Uh, perhaps you yourself have served in the armed forces, but these were auxiliaries. Uh, interestingly enough, when I was looking for photographs for this next organization, I could not find any. And then I realized that this was strictly a civilian organization. And that would be the Women's Air Service Pilots. 
Uh, it was a merged organization from two different groups, the Women's Flying Training Detachment and the Women's Auxiliary Flying Squadron. And it was actually a civilian organization. They were employees of the federal government, as any other uh, general federal employee job. They just happened to be pilots. So they were not part of the military at all. So as a result, there were no military um, posters, recruiting posters, like you see that I've got with the other organizations. Um, this was a teeny-weeny little organization that you may or may not have heard of. Uh, they were founded uh, by Jackie Cochran and Nancy Love in the hopes that these women could also relieve men to fight. And the idea was that they would deliver uh, airplanes to bases. They wanted to do it around the world, but it was strictly done domestically. Uh, and they also, this is crazy, they towed targets so they would fly with a target attached to the back. They would fly through the air, and then the military folks on the ground would shoot at them. So these women were quite brave. Uh, so they did quite a bit. They also did simulated strafing missions, um, and they did transport cargo, again, all over the country. Over 25,000 women applied to be in the WASPs, uh, but only one, uh, 1,830 were accepted, and out of that, 1,074 actually graduated. And unfortunately, the last class of graduates only graduated about three weeks before the program was disbanded uh, in December of 1944. So the government apparently decided it no longer needed them. Maybe they thought the war was um, going to be over sooner rather than later, or they just really didn't feel like they needed the ladies to do the job anymore. Um, however, fortunately for these ladies, in 1977, President Jimmy Carter did award them veteran status um, and military status. So well done, President Carter. And then there are um, a couple of other organizations, also uniformed women. And you had you have the Army Nurse Corps. And again, you don't want the um, Navy to be outdone. So you have the Navy Nurse Corps. And again, as you can see, each of these armed forces had their own uniforms um, that they created. Now, the Army Nor Nurse Corps has been around since 1901. It was already founded in, by Congress at that point, and it makes up one of six branches of the Army Medical Department and completely comprised of registered nurses. So the only way to be in the Army Nurse Corps is to be a registered nurse, uh, and they go in as a commissioned officer. Um, at the beginning of World War II, there were fewer than 1,000 of these Army nurses, um, and then recruiting was done, uh, shamefully, targeting single white women uh, between the ages of 22 and 30, and they needed to have received their training at civilian schools. Uh, as soon as they got married or um, became pregnant, they were discharged, um, and, but they did not actually receive active military status until February of 1944. Uh, but their ranks did swell, and by the end of the war, they had over 54,000 young women in the ranks of the Army Nurse Corps. Uh, the Army Navy, excuse me, the Navy Nurse Corps, these acronyms are a bit of a tongue twister, uh, was formed in 1908, so a handful of years after the Army Corps. Um, according to a variety of different websites that I found and different sources, uh, it was claimed that the Navy had these women serving unofficially for decades, acting as nurses, uh, and some places even claimed uh, serving more than a century. So one thing I thought was really interesting that these women did, uh, because the, the Navy nurses were not allowed near combat, in combat, anywhere near um, the front lines, it was their job to train the hospital corpsmen who were going to then be sent to work on the fighting ships because the women were not assigned to those locations. But these nurses, um, listen, listen to all the stuff that they were trained in. They had surgery, orthopedics, anesthesia, contagion, nutrition, dietetics, physiotherapy, and psychology. So again, these women were incredibly well-educated and ultimately ended up serving on six of the seven continents across the globe.
And they were a fairly small organization as well. Only 12,000 um, women served. I thought it was interesting that the um, over-the-water branches, if you will, the Coast Guard and the Navy, had much smaller ranks than the Marines and the Army, which I, I you know, who knows why, but I think it's just a very interesting little factoid that the Navy and the, and the Coast Guard groups were quite a bit smaller. A um, little bit of um, interesting trivia. Again, when the, when the groups decided that they wanted to have these women serving, they had to rush and come together and figure out what a uniform would look like for these different uh, women. And then they had to have them made. Um, and at least from what I could find out, the Women's Army Corps um, and the Women's uh, Army Nurse Corps, their blouse, which is what the top was called underneath the jacket, uh, was a, was a, a male um, a male blouse so they couldn't come up with a women's outfit fast enough and so they just used small sizes um, on the women until they could pull their act together and do that so uh, lots and lots of women served in uniform across the globe doing their part uh, both behind the lines um, and in front of the lines so thank you to these women for their service and as always uh, trailblazing for folks like me who came behind them. So thanks for stopping by. Again, my name is Linda Shenton Matchett, and I am an author of World War II fiction. And if you are as much as a history geek as I am, you may wish to stop by my website, which is www.lindashentonmatchett.com. And if you want, you can sign up for my newsletter, you can follow my blog, or you can find follow me on Facebook. And all of that information is on, on my website. So again, thanks for stopping by, and I hope you have a really blessed week. Thanks a lot.